All right. If you don't mind, if we could just have one more word of prayer, I would appreciate that. Let's go ahead and pray. Father, thank you for the privilege to be here this morning. And uh, we thank you for who is here in this room and those who will be listening to this message. Father, we, uh, we need you this morning. And uh, we just want to humbly submit ourselves to your will, to your way, to your word. And I pray that you would fill me, thy servant, with thy spirit. I pray you'd fill thy people with the spirit of God so that we might hear what you would say to us, that we might be better, that we might be better off, that we might be better Christians for the glory of God. Amen. And help us, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Two taxidermists stopped before a window in which an owl was on display. They immediately began to criticize the way it was mounted. Its eyes were not natural. Its wings were not in proportion with its head. Its feathers were not neatly arranged and its feet could be improved. When they had finished with their criticism, the old owl turned his head and winked at them. <laughs> Sometimes our criticisms are unmerited, amen? A baker suspected that the farmer who was supplying his butter was giving him short weight. He carefully checked the weight and his suspicions were confirmed. Highly indignant, he had the farmer arrested. At the trial, the judge was satisfied and the baker chagrined at the farmer's explanation. He, the farmer, had no scales, so he used balances and for a weight, he used a one pound loaf of bread bought daily from the baker. Sometimes when we judge, we point a finger, but we have three fingers pointing right. back at us. Right. Amen. So if you would, please turn in your Bibles to John 7, John chapter 7 and Luke 18. John chapter 7 and Luke 18. And uh, we're going to try to rapid fire some scriptures to you, try to be a blessing. I know if you get the scriptures, you'll get some help. <laughs> and uh, so let's go ahead and just jump right in here. And thank you for your attention to the Word of God. And also being gracious as our teacher is gone for the week. I love Brother Church. I love being in this Sunday school class. And, uh, but, uh, but I believe the Lord has something for us if we'll listen and take heed to the Word of God. So John chapter 7 and Luke 18. So the message is, is it right to judge? So I want to ask the question, is it right to judge? Exactly. It all depends on the definition. There's a lot of definitions of judge, but I want to focus on just basically two. One definition is, is to examine, to discern between good and evil, between right and wrong. Mm -hmm. Another definition deals with passing sentence and condemning. We're going to simplify this because there's no way we can go. And there's so many directions we could go with this message, but, uh, First, I want to say that uh, in John 7, verse 24, as is in our bulletin, uh, Christians are commanded to judge. We're commanded to judge what? Righteous judgment. John 7, 24 says, judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. That's what happens a lot of times when we judge with our eyes. We get very humbled that it wasn't quite as what we thought. The Jews here in uh, John 7 were priding themselves in their supposed adherence to the letter of the law of Moses. Jesus had healed a man on the Sabbath day, and these strict religionists were accusing Jesus as if it were wrong to heal on the Sabbath. You said, but the letter of the law says it's wrong. Right, but we're talking about the spirit of the law. We're in the New Testament. We're not under the law. And by the way, I want to preface this, guys. This message is for Christians and for Christian living, not this is not a salvation message. This is not evangelism. So just presupposition is this is for Christian living and for Christians that know that they're saved. We can deal with evangelism on another date. This is strictly for Christians and Christians living and it's preventative. Amen. So no one's judging anyone here except if, it's, if we're judging ourselves. That's what we want to do. So Proverbs 1 or Proverbs 11 one says a false balance is an abomination to the Lord, but a just weight is his delight. Proverbs 16, 11 says, a just weight and balance are the Lord's. All the weights of the bag are his work. Mm -hmm. 
You see, my friends, when we look at this scale, we're doing that every day. We're making judgments. And what do we compare when, when they used to put weights on the, on, on the scale here? They had to have a just weight, a perfect, like a one pound, like we had the illustration, mm -hmm. not a uh, just under a pound, not over a pound, but exactly a pound. And you have to have a just perfect measure in order to have a perfect judgment. And so Proverbs 16, 11 tells us what the weight is. Who is just? Only God. A just weight and balance are the Lord's. All the weights of the bag are his work. See, when we compare ourselves with other people, we're not just. We're not a just weight. So when we compare ourselves one to another, we're not wise. Only God. We can only compare ourselves to God. At the judgment seat of Christ, it's going to be based on him, Amen. his work, not us. That's why we, it's, it's just foolish for us to judge each other. Because none of us are just perfectly. Amen. <coughs> he that is spiritual judgeth all things. We're commanded to judge. Amen. Thou hast rightly judged. Uh, Luke 7 says when uh, Jesus was talking to Simon the Pharisee. Uh, who, you know, who would have more sin forgiven? The, who would love most those that had the most sin forgiven? And, and Jesus said to that, that Pharisee, thou hast rightly judged. So we're commanded to judge. 1 Corinthians 6 tells us that the saints will judge angels. So, is it right to judge? Absolutely. It's commanded that we would discern good and evil using the just weight, which is the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Number two, we are commanded to not judge hypocritical judgment. So, you're holding your place in Luke 18. Also pick up John 8. And uh, we'll start in Luke 18, beginning in verse 9. We can learn from anyone. If we're not too high on ourselves and think we're better than everybody else, we can learn from atheists. We can learn from people that don't agree with the Baptist distinctives. Amen. <laughs> uh, there's a lot of... Uh, we, we just need to just open our understanding. We can learn from Pharisees, even though you, we may not think we're Pharisees. Or, uh, and by the way, Pharisees started out good. They wanted to separate from the world. And they were very, uh, mm -hmm. right? They were, they were wanting to do right and separate from evil. Mm -hmm. So that was, a good, that was a good motive. But then when it goes so much over to where now you're demanding man to keep the commandments of those Pharisees versus God... Now you've gone over too far. And sometimes we can do that. We got to be careful. So Luke 18, verse 9 through 14, let's read. And, and he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican, standing afar off, would not lift up so much as his eyes into heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For every one that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. A couple takeaways from this passage. Mr. Pharisee was so busy judging others to see his own sin. He was blind. Uh, God humbles those who despise others. Doesn't the Bible say, uh, he that uh, despiseth his neighbor sinneth, right? But he that hath mercy on the poor, happy is he. Amen? So the result of Mr. Pharisee not examining and judging his own sin was that the one that he despised ended up having more favor with God than him. That's humbling. Uh, remember Haman? Haman despised Mordecai and all the Jews of the kingdom. Yeah. But who ended up second in command? Mordecai. You remember Joseph was despised and was judged by all of his brothers? Yeah. Who ended up second in command in, in all of Egypt, second to Pharaoh? Joseph. We are commanded not to judge hypocritical judgment. In John chapter 8, uh, verse, uh, verse 3 through 11... We're just going to, I just want to give you the scriptures. I'm learning guys that the more scripture we give, the better. Amen. Amen. I used to write my notes with all my thoughts. That doesn't help people. 
The word helps people. So let's get into the word. John 8, 3 through 11. And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, this is John 8, verse uh, 3, and now verse 4. They say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what sayest thou? Isn't it interesting how the Lord's going to help us to see the heart or the mind or the motive of someone when we don't know what the heart of someone is? That's why we can't judge people. We don't know what's going on inside, but the Lord does, and he gives us a glimpse inside this Pharisee. Look what it says, verse 6. This they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down with his finger, wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, he that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, be, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Amen. Verse 5, these elite religious folks were condemning a sinful woman based on the letter of the law. Verse 6, they not only were judging an adulterous woman, but were accusing the very giver of the law. Hmm. Who accuses sinners and the lawgiver? Who is the great accuser of the brethren? Correct. So when we have, when we judge hypocritically, because those, those Pharisees that brought that adulterous woman, by the way, they didn't, they didn't bring the man. He was just as guilty. But were they perfect? No, they didn't keep the law perfect either. So hypocritical, hypocritical judgment is when we judge others, when we're guilty ourselves. And so Romans 2.15 tells us that our thoughts either accuse or excuse others. And so the word accuse, that's Romans 2.15. I'm just going to give you a lot to go back and study because we don't have time to break everything down. But I want to give you the definition of accuse. Accuse is to blame, to charge with a fault, or declare to have committed a crime by complaint. Accuse. That's what our great enemy does. And when we're not in the spirit, we're like him. That's why we want to walk in the Spirit, amen? The word excuse means to pardon, to overlook, to acquit of guilt, to forgive entirely. What an amazing definition. To excuse is to pardon, to overlook, to acquit of guilt, to forgive entirely. Now, verse 6 here in, in John 8, it says, But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground, as though he heard them not. It's like he was ignoring them. What can we learn from that? Sometimes the word goes silent when we're judging others. Again, when we point the finger, we've got three fingers pointing back to us to remind us, hey, judge yourself, buddy. Amen? Amen. Uh, verse 7 was the game changer. Verse 7 was the grace of God come into this, this uh, repentant, sinful woman where it says what? He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. Y'all want to judge? Go ahead. When you're perfect, go ahead. But none of us are. <laughs> Amen. Only Jesus. All, all judgment has been given by God the Father to Jesus. And he didn't even judge us while he was here. He could have, but he didn't. That's postponed to the judgment seat. Now, obviously, again, we're not talking about salvation. If you're saved by the blood of Christ, you don't have to worry about being judged for your sins. That was already taken care of on the cross. Amen. Amen. We're talking about practical Christian living. Uh, Everything that we do after we got, get saved, that'll be judged towards rewards or not. Okay? And uh, that's a whole other message. So, the accusers in our text here in John 8 were brought to conviction when the Word of God was used as a mirror to reveal to them their own sinfulness. This is when unjust judging stops. When does it stop? When we go to the Word of God as a mirror. 
That's why we need to be in the Word of God. We'll be less judgmental of others when we're in the Word of God. Why? Because we're going to see ourselves. And the more I see my sinful self, the less I'm judging others. Because I want God's mercy. Amen. The Word of God is a mirror. We need to be in the mirror. James 4, verse 11 through 12. It says, speak not evil. Why don't we turn there? James, James 4. Would you turn to James 4? I want you to see this. This is, we got some really powerful scriptures that uh, trust will be a blessing. You say, man, I'm, but I'm feeling convicted. Well, sometimes the blessing comes later. First, we need the fiber to clean us out. We need to be cleansed. And then when we get purified, then the bigger blessings come. Amen. God will use us more if we're clean vessels. And this is just kind of a preventative message of fiber to just clean us out. Amen. Just to get a, a check. We all need just a check once in a while. Amen. All right. James 4, verse 11 and 12. Speak not evil one of another, brethren. Watch this definition of, judge, of judging. He that speaketh evil of his brother and judgeth his brother speaketh evil of the law and judgeth the law. But if thou judge a law, thou art not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and destroy. Who art thou that judges another? Isn't that, isn't that interesting? Speak not evil one of another. Brethren, he that speaketh evil of his brother and judgeth his brother. When we speak evil of the brethren, you know what we're doing? We're judging. Hypocritical judgment. That's not what we're supposed to do. Guys, this was really interesting. As I was studying this week... I have never experienced this in my life. As I'm, I'm, as I'm in my study, I'm looking out the window, and about 30 feet from me at, on a, a telephone pole was a hawk. And this hawk had a prey underneath it. And I, and I got to just staring at it like, what? I actually got my binoculars out. And I'm like, what in the world? This is... And, and it was a bird. Mm. And this hawk was literally devouring this bird this bird and I got to thinking it's like the Lord actually the Lord got me up about 3 30 one morning and gave me this scripture which I'm about to give you which wasn't really part of the message but apparently it is now <laughs> but in Galatians 5 let's let's turn there this was just was absolutely amazing because it was so indelible such an indelible mark uh on me when when God showed me this like right in front of my eyes this this I mean I was I don't want to get gruesome here but I was Watching this hawk, like, devour this bird. Like one of his own kind. Mm -hmm. Come on. And then God gave me this scripture, Galatians 5, 15. But if ye bite and devour one another, take heed that ye be not consumed one of another. Good. <sighs> Whoa. Let's back up a verse. Look at verse 14. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even this. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. But if ye bite and devour one another, take heed that ye be not consumed one of another. Look at verse 16. This I say then, walk in the spirit, and he shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. You know what one of the lusts of the flesh is? Biting and devouring one another through judgment. Hypocritical judgment. In our mind. You say, but I'm, not, but I'm not saying anything bad about that brother or sister. Yeah, but you're thinking it, and That's God right. sees the heart. God Amen. sees your mind. Yep. <clears throat> so that was free. That wasn't part of the message. That was just a little extra there on the hawk. But uh, praise the Lord. That was fitting. And uh, praise the Lord for it. Now, Matthew 7. This is probably where everybody's been waiting to go. <laughs> judge not. Judge not, right? This is where most people... Uh, are familiar with the judge not uh, syndrome. Matthew 7 and Romans 14. Matthew 7 and Romans 14. Now Matthew 7 is, the, is towards the end of the Sermon on the Mount. It's written to believers. We know that from uh, Matthew 5 verse 1. It tells us this is written to the disciples. So we know this is written to the believers. So Matthew 7 verses 1 through 5. Let's go and read it together. Uh, I'll, I'll read it out loud. You read it silently. Judge not that ye be not judged. <clears throat> For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged, and with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how wilt thou say to my brother, let me pull out the mote out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye? 
Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and thou shalt show clearly to cast out the mote of thy brother's eye. Notice, brethren, in verse 5, who this is addressing. We know it's addressing Christians, but notice it's saying, thou hypocrite, verse 5. Can Christians be hypocrites? Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Now, we can't be hypocrites positionally, but we can practically. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Positionally in Christ, if we can't sin. Our, the, the part that's saved can't sin. That's the part that goes to heaven because no sin can go to heaven. But practically, you know, we still sin because we're still in a sinful flesh, still yeah. sinful body. That's why there's that war and that battle going on between do right, do wrong, do right, do wrong. That's why that's where judgment comes in. <clears throat> Many try to use this scripture in Matthew uh, 7 to justify sin. Have you ever been downtown uh, street preaching or giving out the gospel and outreach or whatnot, and someone comes up and says, Judge not, lest you be judged. <laughs> They're not always using that in context. Okay? Uh, if we are making, if we're judging uh, something like, if we're preaching the gospel, someone may feel judged. But that's God judging them, not us. And if we've judged ourselves in that area, it's not hypocritical judgment. So, here's a key point, guys. I want you to remember, this passage in Matthew 7, judge not, is not prohibiting honest, just, righteous judgment. It is a solemn warning against hypocritical judgment. Verse 2 is the key. It says, we will be judged by what judgment we judge others, and to the extent that we judge others, we will be judged. Isn't that what it says? For with what judgment you judge, you shall be judged. And with what measure you meet, it shall be measured to you again. James tells us, So speak ye and so do as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. For he shall have judgment without mercy that hath showed no mercy. And mercy rejoiceth against judgment. That's James 2, 12-13 if you're taking notes. The merciful man doeth good to his own soul, but he that is cruel troubleth his own flesh. Amen. The beam is removed out of our eyes when we judge ourselves by the examination, mirror, and word of God. Whoa. Once we see ourselves. <laughs> it's the key, guys. It's the key. So is it right to judge? Yes. Discerning right and wrong, good and evil, and making wise decisions, it is right to judge. Discern good and evil. And we use this as the key. That is the work, the just weight that God delights in. That's the just weight. It's, it's Him. It's His work. It's all about Him. He's the standard of measure. Everything that we use to judge something needs to be perfect. Amen. Jesus Christ alone is the only perfect standard of measure, Amen. not us. Amen. So, is it right to judge? No. Condemning others in our minds, speaking evil of the brethren and judging hypocritically without judging ourselves first? No, that's not right. And it will be, we will be judged for that. Can be judged to go to hell? No. No. Oh. The judgment seat of Christ is when we will be judged. Not for sin on the count of the cross, but our practical sin. If, we, if, if we're saved and we live a life of just judging others and just really not walking according to this word, the judgment seat of Christ won't provide a lot of rewards. We'll still be saved, yet so as by fire. Okay? That's a whole other message. I'm getting ahead of myself, but... <laughs> All right. So Romans 2, 1, listen to this. Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest, for wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. For thou that judgest doest the same things. I'm on an on-ramp, getting onto the freeway. And this, this, <coughs> this car is like speeding up so that I can't get in. 
And in my mind, I am judging this person. What is wrong with this person? Why won't they just let me in? And I was like adamantly judging them. But I was justified, right? And then the Holy Spirit says, uh, what does the law say? Well, the law says those that are coming on are supposed to yield to the traffic. I wasn't yielding. I was expecting my own way. And that's when the word of God smote me and said, you were wrong, not him. So don't judge him. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. <laughs> Can I have another? No, 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 no. That's good. That's good. That's good enough for now. Thank you. So, Amen, but we've got to be sensitive to the Lord's leading. Amen. Amen. Romans 14. I'll get, you got you to see the scripture. Romans 14. We're almost, almost there. Romans 14. You got to see this. This is powerful. Romans 14. I hope this is a help. My intent with this message is to be a help, not to judge you. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> this, I mean, God's t telling me to judge myself. And so you just get to get on the blessing. Amen. You get to do the same if you choose. So Romans 15, 14, look at this. Romans 14 verses 10 to 13. It says, but why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. That's right. Let us not therefore judge one another anymore, but judge this rather that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. Amen and amen and amen. amen. Instead of belittling the brethren, why don't we make them better than ourselves? Amen. Whoa, but then, then I won't get ahead. Well, according to corporate America, you won't get ahead. But if you do right and you have integrity, you will get ahead. Mo Amen. Most millionaires are, don't get, and I say this in, in a positive light, not a negative light. Most people with wealth that are Christians and are actually good people, believe it or not, that is true. They are, there, are, there are some, <laughs> and there are many. Um, they get there by integrity. Amen. They're not. They're not wicked. Uh, that's a whole another message. I've got a whole other couple of messages coming up. Amen, brother. Just, uh, but we do want you back, brother David. Amen. All right. So, how about instead of gossiping, that we genuinely praise others? What's gossiping? Talking evil behind someone's back. Uh, instead of hindering someone's walk with a stumbling block, why don't we help them? Instead of criticizing someone, why don't we comfort them? Because they're probably hurting just like you are. Wow. We are all hurting in some area, so we don't know what's going on. Maybe that person that, that just, uh, just cut in front of you on the freeway, maybe they just lost their mother. Maybe they just, they just lost their child. Maybe they just had something that was horrible that happened to them. And if we can, by faith, brethren, try to give someone the benefit of the doubt because we don't know what they're going through. They might have had just the worst day of their life. But once we learn that, it's like, oh, then we give grace. Amen. Because we need to do that by faith. Amen? Because too, too often, I think we can be so judgmental. I know I can. Um, instead of fighting... Let's just forgive them. By the way, when we release someone uh, from that bitterness and guilt, guess who we're releasing? Yourself. Amen. Amen. Guys, I'm going to be I'm going to be transparent. Last year, the Lord, uh, it was a game changing year for me. Not that it was a great year; it was probably one of my hardest years. But what was amazing is God allowed me the grace to get right with someone. You know, when we hear preaching. Don't be bitter. Don't, you know, if you have anything against a brother, get it right. Yeah. And in my mind, every time you said that, someone had judged me and I was bitter against them. Yep. They judged, and I won't go into detail, but I'm just saying I was still harboring it. I'm like, how do I get, how do I get, how do I get rid of this? I, I don't know how to get, you know, it's like, but he's guilty, not me. How do I, how do I get that? But then the Bible says, go to that person privately. Was it Matthew 18, 15 or something like that? Right. And that's an amazing scripture. Well, last year, by God's grace, I invited this person. And it was a long period that I was harboring against this person. 
but they were guilty, not me. <laughs> okay. But the Bible says, if you've been, if they've offended, you, you're supposed to go to them because they may not know that they offended you. But what I'm saying that is it was a long period of time, like over 10 years that this was going on. This was a deep rooted, what do you call bitterness, root of bitterness. Mm -hmm. It's only by the grace of God that I'm able to stand here right now. Because most people that get bitter in the root of bitterness, it defiles many, it destroys them, they lose their testimony and they're done. Mm -hmm. And it's only by the grace of God I'm standing here today. Amen, but I want to just praise God because I, ha I didn't have the right spirit before that time we went to Starbucks and we made it right. Because I would have still been judging them and I would have been said, didn't you know you did this? Didn't you know you did this? Don't you know how much that, how much that hurt me? That wasn't the right spirit. But when I had the right spirit, I brought that person and there was apologies. All the thing that I was waiting for them to do to me, like without my initiation. But God says, they're not supposed to initiate. You are, if you've been hurt, you're supposed to go to that person and say, look, in a right spirit, you hurt me. This is what happened. That's how you get it right. You do it by God's way. Mm -hmm. Guys, it was a game changer. As soon as that happened, it's just like, boom, all these, all these opportunities began to, I, Amen. we got to get rid of the bitterness guys. Amen. And that's not the message, but, but apparently it's God's message, but, uh, but it relates, it relates to the judgmental spirit. Um, so praise God. So in closing four things that we can do to avoid a hypocritical judgment of others. You say, but I'm not judgment of uh, judging of others. I'm not judging others. When you get into the law of the Lord mm -hmm. as the mirror. Oh, but I want to do that because then I'll see myself and then I'll be convicted and have to change. Have to become Christ-like. That's what we want, brethren. Amen. That's what we want. Don't we want that? So four things in closing that we can do to avoid hypocritical judgment of others. Number one, consider our own sins. Consider our own sins. First Corinthians eleven thirty one. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. Again, use the mirror of God's word to see ourselves clearly. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. Amen. Amen. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to thy word. Amen. Amen. So number one, we need to consider our own sins. The beam. Number two, confess our sins. First John one, nine. If we confess our sins, right. And verse eight says, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves <laughs> and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us. Do you realize that's conditional? If Oh, but I understand that that was sin. That was lusting after a woman because she was. But confessing is, Lord, I agree with you. That was sin. Forgive me. That was a lustful look. Let's bring it down to reality here. Amen. Um, it's conditional. Hebrews 2 1 says, Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. In many ways, this message is very basic. But sometimes the basics are what's needed. Amen. I think it was Vince Lombardi, a great uh, football coach of the Green Bay Packers. <laughs> Sorry, David. Uh, Green Bay Packers. And <laughs> some of you know where that came from. But uh, what's amazing about Vince Lombardi is that even though he brought many of his teams to the championships, every time he would start with a, with a new team, he would say, guys, this is a football. He got to the basics in any sports team. When they, when, a, when a team gets out of their, out of their rhythm, what do they say? Get back to the basics guys. We're getting back to the basics. You want revival. You want revival in your home, in your workplace, in your church. This is the key right here. Cause when we get right, that's when it's a game changer. Amen. Boy, if, if that, if this person would get right, if this leader would get right, if this, no, <laughs> Let's take responsibility. Amen? amen. Stop putting the blame on everybody else. Let's take responsibility. That's when revival comes. Amen. 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 <laughs> All right. So number one, we consider our own sins. Number two, confess our sins. Number three, commit to ceasing from our own sins. Practically. You say, but I'm, I'm saved. I don't sin. Uh, if you are saved, 
you still have sin. Yeah, your sin's been judged as far as salvation's concerned, but let's not be hypocrites. We still live in a sinful body, Amen. and we still need to deal with our sin. Amen. Some, someone has said, well, keep short accounts uh, with, with God. You know what's better than keep short accounts? Keep no accounts. <laughs> Lord, if there's any sin in me, if there's any known sin, Lord, bring it to my mind so I can confess and get it right. Amen? So consider our own sins. Confess our own sins. Number three, commit to ceasing from our own sins. Proverbs 28, 13 says, He that covereth his sins shall not prosper. But whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. And praise God for his mercy. Amen. Amen. You say, what if, but what if I do it? What if I do it again? What if I do it again? That's, that's the enemy speaking, right? Mm -hmm. Well, let me ask you this. How much forgiveness does the Lord have towards us? It's eternal. East to the west, right? Uh, he has not dealt with us after our sins, nor reward us according to our iniquities. For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. And like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. For he knoweth our frame. He remembereth that we are dust. Amen? Amen. So if his... Forgiveness to us is this like uh, endless reservoir. Then how much forgiveness should we have towards others? Uh, if my uh, brother sinned against me, how, how many times? Seven, seven times? times seven. No, seven times seven. What is it? Seven. Seven, seven. Thank you. Seven. Seventy times seven. <laughs> what does that mean? If someone sins 491 times? Ah, then I can judge. No, that's not what it's saying. The principle is endless forgiveness because eternal forgiveness was on the cross for us. That means we should dish that same forgiveness out. Amen. Amen. Okay, let's take it a step further. So if, if Jesus has endless forgiveness for us and we're supposed to have endless forgiveness for others, how much forgiveness should we have on ourselves when we sin? Good question. Amen. Endless. Amen. Endless. Why? Based on our goodness? No, the fact we sin proves that we're not good. That's it's right. based on His goodness. The just weight that God, is God's delight. It's the work of Jesus. It's the work of the Lord. That's why we can forgive others. That's why we can forgive ourselves. Because the Lord forgave us. Amen. 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 And we shouldn't have the spirit of fear of... Uh, in this in this in this in this realm so number four so we we learn number one in order to avoid a hypocritical judgment we consider our own sin we confess our own sin and commit to cease from our sin and then number four and lastly claim the victory of cleansing Amen. over our own sins again first john 1 9 if we confess our sins he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness the thought of foolishness is sin. So even our thoughts can be sin, right? But God wants to cleanse us of all of this. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Amen. Isaiah 54, 17 says, No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper, and every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment thou shalt contem condemn. This is the heritage of the saints of the Lord, of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. Amen? Amen. You're of little God, children. And I've overcome them because greater is he that is in you than he that's in the world. Amen. We sometimes criticize others unfairly. We don't know all their circumstances nor their motives. Only God, who is aware of all the facts, is able to judge people righteously. John Wesley told of a man that he had little respect for because he considered him to be miserly and covetous. One day when this person contributed only a small gift to a worthy charity, Wesley openly criticized him. After the incident, the man went to Wesley privately and told him that he had been living on parsnips and water for several weeks. He explained that before his conversion, he had run up many bills. Now by skimping on everything and buying nothing for himself, he was paying off his creditors one by one. Christ has made me an honest man, he said. 
And so with all these debts to pay, I can give only a few offerings above my tithe. I must settle up with my worldly neighbors and show them what the grace of God can do in the heart of a man who was once dishonest. Wesley then apologized to the man and asked his forgiveness. We cannot always judge a book by its cover, brethren. Let's not judge according to appearance, but judge righteous judgment based on God's word and based on forgiveness that we desire ourselves and the mercy that we desire ourselves. And as you would that men should do to you, do you to them also likewise. And in closing, Ephesians 4, 31 and 32, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Let's pray.